Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to today's session. Today's session we will be dealing with bacterial toxins which affect the nervous system. So, essentially we are dealing with two diseases tetanus and botulinism. Both these diseases have lot in common. They are diseases caused by neurotoxins of Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum respectively. The bacteria are similar, the neurotoxins produced by them are similar, yet they have opposite clinical symptoms that is spastic versus flaccid muscle paralysis due to different sites of toxin action and not from different mechanisms of action. Both the mechanisms of action of the neurotoxin of Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum is the same, but they act at different sites. So, one presents with spastic paralysis while the other presents with flaccid paralysis. There is early involvement of the respiratory muscles, which means that rapid recognition and prompt institution of supportive measures is important to help survival of the patient. So, now let us discuss both these diseases one by one. We will start first with tetanus. A 50 year old male came to the outpatient department with complaints of fever 2 days duration, dysphagia 2 days duration, spasm in the muscles of the right arm of 1 day duration. He was a carpenter by profession and had been injured on his right hand 1 week back. He gave no history of any major illness in the past and did not remember if he had taken all his childhood vaccinations. On examination, the patient was restless, the temperature was 39 degrees centigrade, the BP was little raised 140 by 100 millimeters of mercury, systemic examination no abnormality was detected. There was a small deep wound on his right arm half centimeter in diameter which was exuding pus. The muscles around the wound were in a state of contraction. The patient was admitted to the surgical ward. A sample was collected to confirm the clinical diagnosis. Pus from the wound on the right hand was aspirated with a needle and syringe and air from the syringe was pushed out and the syringe capped with the rubber bung and transported to the laboratory immediately. So, this is the pus which was aspirated in the syringe and the syringe was capped with the rubber bung. Some of the pus was also tra transferred into a transport medium that is thioglycolate transport medium. Smears were made from the pus and stained with the gram stain. On gram stain, a few pus cells were seen, an occasional gram positive cocaine cluster was seen gram positive long slender bacilli with terminal round spores were seen giving it a drumstick appearance. The morphology was suggestive of Clostridium tetani. The pus was cultured on blood agar and incubated anaerobically for 48 hours. The growth swarmed across the surface of the medium like a thin film. The inoculation was done only at one end of the blood agar and it swarmed like a thin film across the surface and it travelled right down to the other edge. Initially, the organism gave an alpha hemolysis which later became clear cut beta hemolysis with prolonged incubation. A smear from the colonies was made also. On microscopic examination, the organism was again seen to be a long slender organism 2 to 5 micron by 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 microns. It again had the typical drumstick appearance which we saw in the primary smear. This is the tip one organism with the terminal spore. Some of them were gram positive in young cultures, in older cultures they became sometimes gram negative and they were not capsulated. When we used a spore stain using malicide green and safranin, the spore took up the green stain while the bacterial body took up the pink stain. To confirm that the isolate was a Clostridium tetani, a blood agar plate was taken on half the plate antitoxin was spread and streaks of the organism were streaked across the plate. So, the colony was taken and it was streaked across the plate. On the half on which there was no antitoxin, the beta hemolysis was inhibited while the half with the antitoxin showed beta hemolysis. Swarming was also inhibited on the half where there was no antitoxin. So, this confirmed that the organism was Clostridium tetani because the beta hemolysis and swarming had been inhibited by the antitoxin of Clostridium tetani. Initial pus was also put into Robertson's cooked meat medium. There was blackening of meat after prolonged incubation usually more than 7 days due to the mild proteolytic activity of the organism. This is the blackening of the meat which we saw in our particular 
sample this is just to compare it with which is showing reddening of the meat which is seen in sacrolytic organisms like clostridium perfringens. The test for identification which were used for this particular culture were motility. The organism had a stately motility suggesting it had a peritrichus flagella, indole was positive and sugar fermentation was negative. Confirmation was done more by animal inoculation because it was important to demonstrate the toxin. 0.2 ml of a 5 to 10 day old cooked meat broth culture was injected into the base of the tail of two mice. One was protected with 500 to 1500 units of antitoxin one hour before the test. The test animal developed stiffness of the tail and hind limb followed by paralysis of the tail and hind limb. Then the spine of the animal tended to curve towards the right. No signs were seen in the control animal who was completely protected with the antitoxin. So, the final report obtained from the laboratory was clostridium tetani isolated. No sensitivity testing was done as clostridium are not known to develop resistance. The patient was admitted to the ward, wound debridement of the wound on the arm was done, antibiotics were started, penicillin 10 to 12 million units, metrodazole 500 milligrams every 6 hourly. Antitoxin was given as a form of therapy here, 5 lakh units half intramuscularly and half locally infiltrated. Since this patient was presenting with local tetanus, ventilation and airway assessment was done, but patient was not intubated, but just observed. Now, how does one get tetanus? Tetanus spores are found in the environment, usually in soil, dust and animal waste. It is acquired through contact with this environment. So, roadside injuries which are likely to get contaminated with soil from the environment are likely to get contaminated with some spores of clostridium tetani. It is never spread from person to person. The predisposing factors are the wound must be a tetanus prone wound. So, usually puncture wounds which have a big depth and are likely to have anaerobic conditions which facilitate the germination of the spores of clostridium tetani are more prone to get tetanus. Unsterile injections, application of cow dung on umbilical stump, laps and asepsis following surgeries example air boring, circumcision, otitis media, septic abortions, skin ulcers, abscesses, gangrene and commonly seen in patients who you do drug abuse or skin popping. Now, the clinical presentation may vary. It can present as local tetanus which is the mildest form of the disease, cephalic tetanus, generalized tetanus or tetanus neonatorum. Now, let us see a little bit about each of these types. Local tetanus is an uncommon form of the disease though in this patient we had local tetanus. Persistent contraction of the muscles in the same anatomic area as the injury is seen. Milder form of the disease as I said it is the mildest form of all these types of tetanus that we see only about 1 percent of the cases are fatal and our patient responded well to treatment and was sent home. Kephalic tetanus also known sometimes as cryptogenic tetanus is a rare form of the disease. The infection site is usually in the middle ear where the patient may have an otitis media where other aerobic organisms are present and because of the anaerobic environment occurring in the closed ear you tetanus spores easily germinate. Injuries to the head, a head can be another form by which we get cephalic tetanus. It is characterized by involvement of the cranial nerves, especially in the facial area. Generalized tetanus is usually seen in adults. It begins with rhesus sardonicus or a sardonic smile due to spasm of the muscles of the face, trismus, difficulty in swallowing, generalized spasms, and severe pain with each spasm. Opisthotonus posture with flexion of the arm and extension of the legs as seen in this picture. Upper airway may obstruct or the diaphragm may contract resulting in respiratory distress. The patient remains conscious till the end and autonomic dysfunction is usually the cause of death because of respiratory failure. Neonatal tetanus, generalized tetanus also occurs here and it usually occurs in the newborn. Infants whose mothers are not immunized are at risk. It occurs through infection of the umbilical stump which could be cut with a non sterile syringe or because of the practice of applying cow dung onto the umbilical stump. It was responsible for about 14 percent of all neonatal deaths worldwide. Few decades ago India reported 150,000 to 2 lakh neonatal tetanus cases annually. Then there was an intensive effort to increase immunization in the pregnant mother. Because of this in 2016 the WHO declared that India had reduced this incidence to less than 1 per 1000 live births which is a big achievement for a country of our size. How does the disease actually occur? The clostridium tetani once they have entered through the wound they germinate under anaerobic conditions in the wound and multiply. 
when they multiply they produce a toxin and clinical manifestations of the disease are because of the toxin. The bacteria are restricted to the site of entry, but the toxin travels from the site of entry and the initial bacteria may also die, but the toxin which is present will go and perform the functions and give the clinical disease. The toxin consists of essentially three components, tetanospasmin, tetanolysin and a peripherally acting neurotoxin. Tetanospasmin is the main toxin which is responsible for the signs and symptoms of tetanus. This particular neurotoxin is plasmid mediated and is presence only in the presence of plasmid does the particular organism produce this neurotoxin. Tetanolysin does not really a play a role in the clinical manifestations of the disease, but it is responsible for the beta hemolysis we see on blood agar when we grow the organism. The peripherally acting neurotoxin could play some role in causing the local tetanus. Now, how does this neurotoxin act? There is binding of the tetanospasmin to the ganglioside cell surface receptor on the peripheral motor neuron end. It binds at the presynaptic membrane of the neuromuscular junction, it is internalized and it is transported retroaxinally to the spinal cord. The toxin enters the nerve cells in the brain stem and the spinal cord. So, it is started by from the wound side, from the wound side it goes and attaches to the ganglioside cell surface receptor on the presynaptic membrane, from the membrane it is internalized and once it is inner internalized it is transported retroaxinally to the brain and spinal cord. Now, what does it do when it reaches the cells of the brain and spinal cord? It binds specifically to the neuronal cells enters the cytosol and blocks neurotransmitter release. So, acetylcholine is released from the cytosols normally and it is responsible for transmission of impulses from the higher motor neurons to the lower motor neurons. So, this particular release of acetylcholine is inhibited because the sites are bound by the neurotoxin and thus the inhibitory control of the spinal interneurons is removed. So, inhibitory spinal neurons usually ensure a balanced voluntary muscle contraction, thus their blockage causes spastic paralysis and the muscle is not able to relax in between contractions. The mechanism of action of this toxin is well explained in this particular picture. In a normal muscle, the excitatory signals come from the central nervous system and the muscle contracts, while the muscle is made to relax because of the inhibitory symptoms which come in the inhibitory signals which come in from the inhibitory interneurons. Glycine is released by these inhibitory interneurons. So, this glycine prevents the further release of acetylcholine and the muscle can relax. Now, what happens in, in tetanus? The excitatory signals remain the same. However, the tetanus toxin binds on the nerve, motor nerve end plate and does not let the acetylcholine get released. So, there is no inhibitory effect of the inhibitory interneuron. This binding of the toxin is irreversible and the muscle stays in a state of contraction. So, the basic principles of treatment are essentially neutralization of unbound toxin. As I told you just now, you cannot neutralize toxin which has already been bound. So, ATS 5 lakh units half intramuscularly and half locally is given. This can also be replaced by the tetanus immunoglobulin which is made in human beings. The ATS or the anti tetanic serum of equine origin and it is likely to give anaphylaxis. So, the tetanus immunoglobulin which is of human origin is to be preferred smaller quantities of it is also required 500 international units only and it does not give anaphylaxis. Prevention of further toxin production is the next priority. This can be done by adequate wound debridement. If the wound becomes aerobic, the bacteria will not multiply and fresh toxin will not be produced. Along with wound debridement, antibiotics can be given. Antibiotics could be penicillin and metadazole and both of them have action on clostridium tetani resistance has not so far been reported. So, antibiotic sensitivity testing is not required for confirming which antibiotic to give. The moment tetanus is suspected, it is important to ensure that antibiotics are started well in time. If the patient has an allergy to penicillin, then alternative antibiotics such as clindamycin and erythromycin can be thought of. The third principle of treatment is to control the spasm. Every time the patient goes into a muscle spasm, the muscle spasms are very painful and disturbing for the patient and dangerous because the respiratory and the diaphragm diaphragmatic muscles if they go into a spasm, they may result in respiratory failure. So, the patient should be nursed in a quiet environment, so that avoiding unnecessary stimuli which would stimulate the muscles is important. The airway should be protected and supportive care such as adequate hydration with IV fluids, nutrition and treatment of any other secondary bacterial infection. Now, in this particular patient, we, a few, we saw a few staphylococci also in the smear. So, these staphylococci might require 
another drug for treatment if it is resistant to penicillin. Now, prophylaxis against tetanus usually it can be given either as an active immunization or a passive immunization. The active immunization is important, the tetanus toxoid is a formal inactivated toxin. Three doses are recommended at an interval of 4 to 6 weeks between the first and the second dose and at an and further interval of 6 months the third dose is given. Now, these are valid for about 10 years and a booster is recommended every 10 years. Usually tetanus immunization is given along with diphtheria and pertussis as the triple vaccine which includes tetanus, diphtheria, toxoid and pertussis which is routinely given in childhood. So, if all the childhood immunizations had been done, the patient would have had some amount of immunity to tetanus and would require only a booster dose to re uh, enforce this particular immunity. Passive immunization is not recommended usually except in a patient who has had a massive road injury or a tetanus prone wound where you expect that tetanus may develop then passive immunization can be given anti tetanic serum or tetanus immunoglobulins can be used. Now, in this case whenever passive immunization is given the active immunization should be started side by side. The treatment dose for the passive immunization is 1 lakh units and the prophylactic dose is only 250 international units. The protective antibodies will last for about 4 to 6 weeks that is why it is important to start the active immunization also side by side. The vaccine and the that is the active immunization and the passive immunization should be administered at separate sites with separate syringes for both of them to be effective. Tetanus vaccination in pregnancy is important. If a pregnant woman has not previously been vaccinated or if her immunization status is unknown, she should receive two doses of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine TTCV one month apart with the second dose given at least two weeks before delivery. Tetanus vaccination and clean delivery practices are major components of the strategy to eradicate maternal and neonatal tetanus globally and India has successfully managed to eradicate neonatal tetanus of both these techniques that is tetanus vaccination and clean delivery practices. So, with that we conclude tetanus. Now, again just to summarize tetanus is a clinical diagnosis mostly the laboratory plays very little role in diagnosis because often the organism may not be present or you may not even appreciate the site at which the organism entered like in cryptogenic tetanus. But if a clear cut wound is available and passes there, a simple gram stain from this particular wound would help in confirming a diagnosis of tetanus because the typical drumstick organisms which you would see are characteristic of tetanus and the proper treatment with penicillin, metadrazole and the anti tetanic serum can be immediately instituted while we in the meantime to confirm the pus can be sent for culture because it will take almost 7 to 8 days for culture and by that time it is too late to start administering antitoxin because all the toxin which is already fixed onto the motor nerve neuron end plate cannot be unfixed by the antitoxin. So, now let us go on to the next organism which presents with a similar mechanism of action the disease is called as botulism. Now, let us look at a patient a 45 year old man was brought into the emergency room with complaints of vomiting from 4 hours, intense thirst, difficulty in swallowing and breathing of 2 hours duration, extreme weakness and dizziness for the last 1 hour. Patient gave a history of having consumed canned sausages for lunch within 1 hour of which the vomiting had started. So, it was a very short duration history which had developed very acutely. Patient's eyelids were drooping, pulse was 110 per minute blood pressure was 90 by 60 millimeters of mercury, respiration was a little labored, abdominal examination revealed generalized tenderness, weakness of the muscles of the hand was noticed, reflexes were decreased and hyporeflexia was noted. So, a CT scan was done, but the CT scan was normal, then EMG of the hand was done, the abnormalities obtained were brief small amplitude, motor potentials and an incremental response to repetitive stimuli. All this gave a provisional diagnosis suggestive of Clostridium botulinum infection. Though the infection is not very common in the community, the very fact that the patient had sausages from a canteen made the doctor suspicious that the patient could have got Clostridium botulinum infection. And since it is important to start treatment immediately, he decided to take a start treatment in anticipation of a laboratory confirmation. The differential diagnosis of this conditions which must be kept in mind while diagnosing Clostridium botulinum infection is. Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, stroke and lambert eaton syndrome. EMG picture very characteristic of Clostridium botulinum or the botulinum infection. So, the patient was put on treatment immediately, patient was admitted, IV fluids were started, 
he was given a gastric lavage and intubated to maintain respiration. The family was asked to get any leftovers present in the tin of sausages which could be examined. A polyvalent antibotulism toxin was administered immediately. The polyvalent antibotulism toxin available usually contains three types only that is a type A, type B and type E. Side by side investigations were started, blood count was done, the total and differential count were normal, CSF examination showed a normal biochemistry and cytology were normal, no cells were detected, no bacteria or viruses were detected in the CSF. The lavage fluid, vomitus and food from the can collected in an anaerobic transport medium was sent to the for anaerobic culture. Vomitus and food from the can was also sent for toxicology studies to detect the toxin as the culture again takes for an anaerobic culture it takes 8 days to get a report and by the time it is too late to give the antitoxin. So, toxicology studies give much earlier reports, so the, the vomitus and food were sent for toxicology studies. The microscopy of the food revealed gram positive non capsulated bacilli, large bacilli 5 microns by 1 micron in size with oval bulging spores, this was seen from the food remains. So, large bacilli with oval bulging spores, they were motile with the probably due to a peritrichus flagella again stately motility. The samples were put into a Robertson's cooked meat medium on blood agar and egg yolk agar. The blood agar and egg yolk agar were incubated anaerobically and examined after 48 hours. In the Robertson's cooked meat medium, a butyrous scum was seen on the surface of the medium. On blood agar, large irregular semi transparent beta hemolytic cornies were seen. So, these were the colonies which were seen, this is a close view of a colony seen on blood agar, note the large irregular colonies seen. On egg yolk agar or Willis and Hobb agar, restricted lecithinase and lipase positive colonies were seen. Restricted lecithinase because opacity was seen just a little beyond the colonies and if you see on the surface of the colony, there is a shiny pearly layer on the surface of the colony which looks could be because of lipase action. This lipase breaks down the lipids and gives this shiny layer on the surface. Now, if again half the plate is covered with antitoxin and the colony is streaked through, you will find that both these characteristics of the colony are inhibited. Confirmation of diagnosis is required urgently, because the disease is not very common. So, it is very important to confirm a diagnosis urgently. The diagnosis is confirmed not by detection of the organism, but by detection of the toxin in the stool, serum or food as culture takes almost 7 to 8 days to get the report. Toxin identification is accomplished by neutralization of the toxin by specific sera in mouse experiments. Now, tests have been developed such as the ELISA and a fluorescent based electro chemiluminescence test which can also be used to detect the toxin which are much simpler than the animal tests which were used in the past. So, detection of toxin in animals requires many animals. So, that is why better tests have been looked for. Generally, the homogenized food or vomitus was inoculated into 5 groups of mice. One was kept unprotected. The second was protected with A anti sera, the third was protected with type B anti sera, and the last was protected with type E anti sera. In this particular patient, the group 1, 2, and 4 were killed, and the group 3 survived, indicating that the or infecting organism was Clostridium botulinum type B. So, with these animal experiments, we can even type the type of anti sera, and specific anti sera can be given. Because if specific anti sera is given, the response of the patient is much better than if you gave a polyvalent anti sera. This disease is also mediated by a neurotoxin which is produced by the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. Seven types of botulinum neurotoxins are present A to G that is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, C 1 is also had two types C 1 and C 2. The types that are most commonly infect humans are fortunately only three of them. So, that is type A, B and E. So, polyvalent anti sera used for botulism usually contains anti sera to types A, B and E. A single gram of botulinum toxin could kill over 1 million people. So, it is the most potent poison in the world today. It is more powerful than strychnine and more powerful than rattlesnake poison. The lethal dose for a mouse is 0.000000333 milligrams. Once it is released into the bloodstream, it irre irreversibly binds to the acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction. The toxin acts by blocking the release of acetylcholine at the synapses of the neuromuscular junction. Death is by respiratory failure. So, once the respiratory muscles are involved and they get paralyzed, then death occurs. Now, let us look at the mechanism of action. The mechanism of action of the toxin is similar to what we have seen with Clostridium tetani. 
only this acts at the peripheral neuron muscular ends while that acted at the spinal and cerebral level. The neuron toxin binds to the motor nerve end plate of the nerve and it is internalized. Once it is internalized, it prevents the release of acetylcholine from these vacuoles. And if acetylcholine is not released because this is the botulinum toxin which has been internalized and it is preventing the release of acetylcholine, the impulses are not transmitted to the muscles. So, the muscles land up with flaccid paralysis due to inhibition of acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction. So, if there is flaccid paralysis because the action takes place at the, in the periphery while in the tetanus there is spastic paralysis because the action takes place at the spinal level which prevents the inhibition of the up motor neuron on the lower motor neuron. So, clinical presentation of botulism is that onset is 18 to 36 hours after ingestion of food which contains the neurotoxin. It will of course, depend on the situation in which the food has been kept and how long it has multiplied. So, it is much faster in a closed in which adequate anaerobic conditions are present and the bacteria can easily multiply and produces neurotoxin. Symptoms vary from a mild disease to severe illness. There can be various types of botulism. The most common type which we see in this particular patient is the food borne botulism, but we can also get infant botulism, wound botulism and adult botulism. Food borne botulism usually is obtained from infected meat, sausages, ham and fish, specifically improperly canned foods. So, even vegetarian foods which are improperly canned can also result in food borne botulism. Symptoms as I said earlier appear within 12 to 36 hours, in our patient they appeared within a few hours. Vomiting, thirst, ocular paralysis, difficulty in swallowing and breathing are the first few symptoms and the disease is invariably fatal because it is often not suspected and treatment started on time. Sometimes there is a problem of availability of the botulism antitoxin. Infant botulism is an unusual manifestation of botulism. It often presents as a sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS or a crib death in infants less than 6 months old. It is usually associated with ingestion of honey. There is a practice of making a small newborn baby suck on a little bit of honey. Honey has endospores in it and naturally as bees pick them up from the flowers, of, they germinate in the intestinal tract of the infant. Now, how do they multiply so easily in the intestinal tract of the infant is because the immature intestinal microflora of the infant does not compete with them. So, they have enough space to multiply and release their toxin which is absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract and it results in infant botulism. The clinical features of infant botulism are the infant initially appears lethargic, gives a weak cry, is weak, does not suck milk properly, has flat blunted facial expression. There is excessive drooling because there is difficulty in swallowing, muscle weakness and poor head control. He tends to leave his head back, breathing problems are noted and there is decrease in tendon reflexes on examination. Initially no immunoglobulin is available which was effective in children, but there is a new drug which is now available baby BIG which is a botulism immunoglobulin which can be given intravenously into in these babies. It drastically reduces lethargy, intravenous feeding and overall hospital stay can also be decreased by giving these immunoglobulins well in time. With early detection, proper treatment, the no long term effects are observed in a child in which the SIDS has been suspected to be caused by botulism. An unusual manifestation of botulism is wound botulism. This illness results from pathogen itself infecting a wound. The food is not the vehicle of transmission here. The organism is entered through the soil maybe and the organism multiplies in the wound and produces a neurotoxin which is transmitted to other parts of the body via the blood. This is often seen in intravenous drug users, where they use unsterile syringes. Adult botulism resembles infant botulism, only it occurs in adults. Clostridium botulinum colonizes the intestinal tract of adults and produces toxin in vivo. Infection occurs usually either through contaminated food or often after antibiotic treatment where the principle is the same as in infant botulism because the antibiotic treatment depletes the indigenous intestinal flora. So, the clostridium botulinum which have entered into the intestinal tract get a foothold, they are allowed to multiply there and they sporulate and produce their toxin. It can also occur by inhalation especially during a bioterrorist attack. The symptoms of adult botulism are blurred or double vision, difficulty in speaking or swallowing, fatigue, lack of muscle coordination, descending paralysis and difficulty in breathing. Botulinum toxin is 
considered a high priority or a category A agent for bioterrorism. Apart from being a natural disease, one must keep in mind if there is a cluster of cases that it could be because of bioterrorism. Many countries and terrorists have developed and used botulinum toxin as a biological weapon. As I told you right in the beginning, it is one of the most powerful poisons present in the world today. From 1990 to 95, aerosols were dispersed in multiple sites in Tokyo and at US military installations in Japan by terrorists. In 1995, Iraq revealed that it had deployed more than 11,000 liters of botulinum toxin into SCUD missiles. Botulinum toxin is not all bad. There are various therapeutic implications of botulinum toxin. It has been used in a variety of muscle dystonias, in treatment of strabismus or squints and in cosmetology. Minute amounts of the botulinum toxin are injected into the muscle to be paralyzed. The beneficial effect of such treatment will however lasts only for a few months. The synapse intoxicated with the botulinum toxin degenerates and a new functional synapse reforms in a few months. So, botulinum toxin then has to be re-injected and the whole process has to be repeated. So, how does one prevent botulism? There is no routine immunization recommended for botulism like we give for tetanus because the disease is not so prevalent. Of course, during a bioterrorist attack probably it would have to be used, but then no routine active immunization is recommended. You have to be sure of assurance of destruction or inhibition of clostridium botulism in food is the only safe practice which can prevent occurrence of botulism. Botulinum toxin is destroyed by heating at 80 degrees for 30 minutes or for boiling for a few minutes. Thus, reheating foods properly can be a controlling factor. Foods which have been kept at room temperatures, specifically non-vegetarian food which have been contaminated with spores of clostridium botulinum, if not heated properly could let the bacteria multiply there and germinate and produce the neurotoxin. So, the most important thing is to avoid home canning or use of cheaply produced commercial food. Inspect all canned food which you are using to make sure that the can is not bulging, there is no loose lid, there is no fungus growing in it and there is no odor. If because specifically canned food which have been done in the home or canned food which have been done by some cheap uh, organizations, commercial organizations can have all these factors or it could be even a canned food which has been kept for a very long time. So, before consuming any canned foods, please inspect and ensure that all these factors are not present on the can. Proper home canning procedures for those who are fond of storing food by home canning need to ensure hygiene the time limit for which the canning will be effective, proper processing method and that the appropriate equipment have been used for sterilization of the food which has been introduced into the can. The treatment would be gastric lavage with potassium permanganate and guanidine hydrochloride can act like an antidote. Polyvalent antisera usually I told you A, B and E, intensive supportive therapy especially maintenance of respiration, the patient might require intubation. Antibiotics do not have a role to play in treatment unlike tetanus where antibiotics have to be instituted early. So, it is essentially the anti sera and supportive therapy which helps you recover from an episode of botulism. These are some of the references used in the current presentation. They have some of them have been taken from the net and some of the smears of clostridium tetani have been taken from the anaerobic section of the microbiology department of BJ Medical College. These are also some more pictures which I have used and I would like to thank all the authors whose pictures I have used for this academic presentation. Thank you and have a good day.